Welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Right, here we go. What you think about. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm Lori LeBay, your host, and for those of you who aren't aware, it's World Alzheimer's Month um, to, uh, this month, and on September 21st, the um, Alzheimer's Disease International is going to be releasing their Alzheimer's report, so watch out for that. I always get people asking me about our opening song, which is called Clarion Call. And it's by the Mark Arneson Band featuring My Adore. <clears throat> and you can go ahead and download that on any of your favorite music platforms if you like. For those of you that are new to our show, Alzheimer's Speaks Radio has been going since 2011. And we're about sound information, not just sound bites. And our goal is to raise all voices big and, and, big and small <clears throat> all the way around the world. And apparently I have a frog visiting my throat, so I apologize for that. I think it's a season change and my allergy is kicking into gear. You can also join the show by calling in and sharing your story about being touched by dementia and caring for someone with dementia at 323-870-4602. That's 323-870-4602. Now, before I introduce a couple of our guests today, I want to give a couple of shout outs. And the first is to um, Dementia Alliance International dot org. They are going to be doing a Meeting in the Minds webinar on September 23rd and 24th, depending on where you're located in the world. And it's about human rights as a practice model in a residential aged care. And I'm not only excited about the topic, but I absolutely adore the woman who's putting this on. Daniela Greenwood is from Australia. I had the um, the wonderful opportunity to meet with her when she was in the States a few years back, and she is phenomenal. And I know that the uh, webinar will be of great value. I also want to mention that next week we're going to do something different on the show. On Tuesday, we're actually going to talk with the author of a play, and then we're going to listen to that play. It's 90 minutes, but it's an audio play. And then on Thursday, we're going to have a talk back, and we're going to meet the cast, and we would love for all of you to join us um, on that venture. It'll be kind of fun, kind of like sitting around the radio and listening, like uh, many of us did uh, a long time ago, before there was TV that took over our lives. Um, here in Minnesota, Artist Senior Living of Woodbury is starting a memory cafe, and they'd love for anyone to join. It's going to be virtual, and it'll be the third Wednesday of every month from 1 to 2 p.m. And if you're interested, you can call them to register, 612 200 Um and like I said, our first one is going to be September 16th, so that's next week, so I'm excited about that. And um, with Alzheimer's uh, Disease International, again, they are going to be launching that world report on the 21st, so watch for that. I'll post that on the blog when it comes out as well. And then um, I have two more I want to give shout-outs to. Um, one is to Coral Health. Um, they, they're a company that have some digital d- platforms, and you can actually download uh, two of their apps free. One is called Music First, and the other is Coral Faith, C-O-R-O. So just go to uh, CoralHealth.com, 
and uh, download those apps. Uh, they're letting those go for free uh, during COVID, which is absolutely fantastic. And of course, I want to thank our listeners. Your likes, your clicks, and shares are just so um, so impactful and have really made a huge, huge difference in terms of where we sit in the world and people that know about us. Last, I just want to um, let the foot bar walker here do a little talking, and then we will come right back and introduce you to our guest. Introducing the life-changing foot bar walker. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The foot bar walker revolutionized my care of George. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. The foot bar walker opens and closes just like a standard walker. The only thing that is different is the top bar and the foot bar. Does that ever make a difference? Does someone you love use a walker? Do they struggle to get up from a seated position? Are you a caregiver dealing with physical pain and stress as you help your patient? The foot bar walker was designed to assist not only the patient, but also the caregiver. Patients have more control standing up, and no lifting from the caregiver is required. See how it works at thefootbarwalker.com. That's the thefootbarwalker.com. Peggy, would you recommend the foot bar walker? Do I ever? I would not be in the health that I'm in today at this age had it not been for the foot bar walker. Well, the foot bar walker is something you should check out. I have personally seen it in action and it is amazing. But with no further ado, let me introduce you to a couple of our guests, and all of you are welcome to call in because I think this is such an important topic. Today, we're going to be talking about families touched by dementia, and what have been, you know, what have uh, their experiences been, and they vary. Everyone's in different living situations and different physical conditions, and uh, it's it's. So it's going to be a great conversation, and we would love for you to be part of it. Um, First, I'm going to introduce you to John Sweeney. John, I've known for several years. He's a member of our Memory Cafe here at uh, Arthur's in Minnesota, and he is a care partner for his wife of uh, 70 years. And Virginia was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in May of 2011. And John and Virginia are in their 10th year of their dementia journey. John cared for Virginia at home until uh, January of 2019 when her anxieties became so intense that neither of them were really able to get much sleep at night. So Virginia now lives in a memory care at a section of Cherrywood Point in Roseville, and John is in the same building where he lives independently. So welcome, John. How are you today? Very good. Thank you. Well, thanks for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Rita, and then we'll be off and running with our conversation here. So Rita DeLongchamp Osborne cares for her spouse, Donald, and um, he was diagnosed in 2010. Now, I know Rita from a few years ago. I want to say it was 2017 when we went on a cruise uh, and did a dementia-friendly cruise, and it was such an honor to, to meet both of them and be able to see their their love, and meet some of their other family members as well. Uh, They lived in their home, which was a bungalow in Edmonton, which is a major city in Canada. And on March 20th, um, Donald entered a hospital with an acute inpatient geriatric psychiatric program for an assessment. And then on the 24th of March, um, Donald and Rita celebrated their 36th wedding anniversary. So con- congratulations this year, Rita. And it was also on that, that day that the hospital went into lockdown, as were all of the senior facilities in the Providence um, due to COVID-19. So welcome to the show, Rita. I appreciate you taking time to be with us today. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to to have conversations with both of you. Um, We were also going to have Loretta Woodward, uh, Vinny, with us, but she is very ill, and she is a a fabulous speaker. I suggest you you check her out as well. Um, But she has cared for her mom and just is uh, just a loving, loving soul, like both these two are as well. So I'm going to start out first, and um, John, I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, if you can tell us a little bit about what your experience has been 
through COVID in caring for a loved one with dementia? Well, before COVID, I was able, I'm in the same building with Virginia. She's in the memory care and I'm in independent living. So I could pop in there, I had a fob, I could get in and out anytime I want, three or four times a day. I'd go down at meal times uh, to see if she hadn't eaten, and sometimes she'd sit and stare at her food. So if she hadn't eaten, I would uh, I'd feed her, and then I'd usually go down at bedtime and uh, just kind of tuck her in and kiss her goodnight, and, and that, w- that was special. And then the, <laughs> the hammer dropped, and I, I think it was sometime in March, I don't remember. First off, Outside caregivers were uh, locked out, but I was still able to come because I was in the building. Maybe they thought I was a, less of a threat. Then I was restricted from coming in, and the only caregivers that could get in then were uh, caregivers for someone that was considered uh, end of life. So that's that's what we faced, and and. Uh, then the staff was very good. They would take an iPad and and a few times a week they would go into the uh, residence room and and try to connect with FaceTime. And so we had a short time to visit, and, and I was greatly appreciative of, of that. But I always felt a little time pressure. I felt I couldn't talk too long, you know, for the courtesy others wanted to do the same thing. And... Uh, it, my youngest son said to me, well, Dad, why don't you put an iPad in there? He said, you got two of them. And I said, well, <laughs> uh, he, Mom couldn't answer the iPad. He said, Dad, the newer ones will self-answer. And he was right. So I set it in there, and, and that iPad has a viewing angle of about 56 degrees, so I can see quite a bit of the room. And now I got a great tool. There's no time pressure. I can talk as often as I want. I can, any time of day, I can look and see if she's in there. And there's, a, you know, there's not a lot of conversation. It's mostly one way because we're at that point in in our journey where Virginia cannot do a lot of conversation. And I mentioned that to my son one time, and and he said, "But Dad." That's not for your, for her benefit. That's for yours, and and he was right. You know, I, the joy I get from seeing her, and the uh, one of the things that I I sense that the COVID restrictions they had to eat in. They were locked in their room. Uh, well, not locked, but they were restricted to their room. They couldn't eat out in the common areas. And I I sense that the regression was increasing. And I I think a lot of that was because of the, uh, of the restrictions and, and lack of human contact. Some of the benefits that I'll just share that I get out of the use of that wonderful tool, uh, starting out when she was in her room, I do virtual dining. I'd sit at my computer when she was eating and we would have a virtual uh, share a meal. But mm-hmm. most importantly, I can call if she see if I see she needs help. They'll get her ready for bed a lot of times at night. She'll sit in her nightgown, and I'll watch her and try to visit with her. And then I'll see she's sleepy, and I just pick up the phone. I have some phone numbers. They carry cell phones in there, and I'll call until I get someone get a hold of someone and tell them I, they need to get her to bed. And then in I don't know if it was along about in April I. I connected one morning and I looked in and, and of course the iPads across the room, I didn't have a real close look, but her whole left side of her face was red. And I called the staff member and they come in and she had fell against the nightstand and cut a gash in her head. And, and uh, so then we took her to the hospital right away and got it uh, sewed up <laughs> And then the other thing that I'm able to, uh, so we moved the nightstand, obviously, and I put a sign up. I had them put up a sign up on the wall because every now and then they'll slide a chair in that spot. I don't want anything in there. And uh, the other thing I I have noticed twice, I've seen staff members come in uh, to feed her and their masks are on their chin because, you know, it's uncomfortable when they're out 
and they forget. And so now there's a great big red sign on all of the doors. Stop. <laughs> Pull your mask up before you go in. And then the other thing I noticed, and this is, I'm kind of a nosy old coot, you know, and I think they may resent my <laughs> my snooping, but uh, her glasses were in the laundry one time. One of the staff members heard some clinking, couldn't find out, and they had they had washed the bedding. The glasses were in the bedding, and then I noticed what was happening when they put her eye drops in. She'd be laying in the bed. And they'd put her eye drops in, take the glasses down, and lay it on the bed, and that'd be fine, except if she gave them a rash and a guff, because she does at times, she resists. They would probably forget those glasses are there. And uh, so now we've got a sign. When you pick up glasses or hearing aid, the first thing you do is walk them to the counter and lay it down before you do anything else. So uh, <laughs> that's, that's kind of, and I'll tell you that, I am so thrilled to have that tool and to be able to have this virtual contact with her when I can't get in there. Oh, yeah. That's um, just John has shared this during our memory cafes and just what a relief it is to be able to not be limited in terms of of that contact. Now, I know through the journey now you've been able to get back into the building and do visits, and what was that like from, you know, before the restriction when you were still able to to visit to, you know, today's setting? Well, about August 1st, there was an initiative for the guidelines. Uh, they defined uh, essential caregiver, and essentially, I think the guidelines were because it – for emotional support, not only for the person with the uh, with the Alzheimer's, but also for the caregivers like myself. And so I had the privileges of going in for three hours a day, and that was just great. And all of a sudden, the hammer came down on that on August 13th, because there was a staff member in memory care that was diagnosed or had a positive diagnosis. And obviously it wasn't sick, but it was positive. So everything shut down immediately. And I, I was in with Virginia. I'd been there about two hours when our director of nurses came, came in and told me that. And I said, well, what, do, do I have to leave now? And she said, yes, I think you should. <laughs> and I felt like a corporate executive that uh, was – was fired and the and the security came and helped me carry out my boxes. <laughs> so how it was, and and so then I'm back to uh, back to FaceTime only. <laughs> I got to share. You know, with all of the hurts as a caregiver, when you see your loved one uh, regress, there is some some very good humor. Uh, you know, I tell her. Uh, sweetie pie I tell her I love her and 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 she'd get her to smile and one time I said to her uh, and this is over the iPad of course I said honey I love you very much did you know that yeah you just told me <laughs> yeah it's those little <laughs> moments that just melt your heart and the other funny one this iPad stands up on a stand a long pole and a base and she doesn't always know where I am, but uh, the uh, staff will point, there's your husband, Virginia. She looked over, all she sees is my head and this big long stash. She's, man, you've got long legs. <laughs> now, you, now, you've September, written... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, September 2nd now, uh, the essential caregiver is open Again, I now have my privileges of three hours a day. However, two days ago, we got a note that there was another staff member, not out of memory care, but another staff member in the building that was tested positive. But so far, they haven't shut that down. Okay. Do do they have they said what the limits will be in terms of when they will pull back or? No, no, no. Uh, as far as I know, this will be our status for quite a while. One of the other things that we have uh, is uh, the courtyard just north of uh, of the uh, memory care. 
uh, they have set out a visitation place and family members can uh, make a reservation online and have up to 20 minutes. And uh, now I don't know what we'll do this winter time because we were out there Sunday with my grandson and it was cold. <laughs> mm-hmm. And Virginia has this doll that is their constant companion. We have a little video of her wrapping the doll up with her sweater to keep her warm. Oh, how cute. How cute. Now, John, you wrote a limerick about your life at uh, Cherrywood with with, uh, with COVID. Do you want to share that with people? Yeah, if we've if we got time. Sure. To, to understand this, you have to realize that there's not a stick of furniture anywhere in the common areas in this place. <laughs> And, and there's no dining room now. They bring the food to our doors. So here is the coping with COVID at Cherrywood Point. And it goes like this. The breakout of COVID had a profound effect in Cherrywood Point. The effect could be seen with changes all over the joint. The lobby was like an empty warehouse with no couch or chair. It became apparent that there was to be no sitting and chatting there. And family and visitors who had been very welcome here before were restricted from visiting. They couldn't even get in the door. And oh, how we used to love the delightful food in the dining hall. But we now eat in cardboard takeout boxes in our own private stall. We run around wearing masks and shields covering our chin. We couldn't identify a perpetrator if a robber walked in. Though the staff wear masks and face shields when caring for our elders, and the shields pull down their faces like a covey of shipboard welders. Uh, it's a new world at Cherrywood with all of the restrictions in place. Grumbling and complaining, many with sour looks on our face. Ah, but notwithstanding these, all the things that make us chafe, we are grateful to management from the virus we've been safe. Well, that is, and that is so true. All of the things that you have to go through, but the bottom line is, you know, they care. They know, you know, they're protecting everybody uh, the best they can. Most and, important and, thing. And that's been really hard for a lot of communities. And, and I don't think families all understand how much the guidelines have changed and how job descriptions uh, for people that work in the communities have had to change and root to keep up with, uh, with all of this. I have a lot of friends, needless to say, that work in the industry and, um, you know, they're exhausted. <laughs> they're just exhausted from trying to keep on top of everything. It's just been really quite the, Quite the wild ride. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, John. I'm going to pull in Rita now and kind of hear a little bit about her story. And um, if you don't mind hanging out with us, so I might have some questions for you in a bit. Okay? Okay. Great. Um, well, well, Rita, why don't you give us a little background on how you've been coping with things? Because, um you know, you're in a little different situation. So if you can kind of explain your home environment and, and where Donald is at and what that has been like for you, maybe what the anticipation of him uh, going in for the assessment was and what it ended up being. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, I want to tell you, Lori, that um, when Don was diagnosed in 2010, um, there were only three resources I could find at the time, and one was uh, a memory, uh, the memory people site. One was uh, a book that uh, someone who started an Alzheimer organization, and the other one was you, Lori. And I followed <laughs> you since since you started, and that's where I got a lot of my information. So I just wanted to thank you. <laughs> now for Don, um, he was diagnosed. Uh, This past year, he's in the late stages, and this past year there had been more falls and there had been more issues, and I was taking care of him 24 hours. Um, I had put in a request in January, February for respite because I wanted to get uh, my eyes, eyes, uh, cataract removed so I could see. (laughs) I was starting to, it was starting to affect my uh, eyesight. Um, So I had asked for respite. So that I can go get this done. 
Yeah. Uh, I'd ask for two weeks. When I ask for a respite, they uh, they do an assessment. And during that time, February, it takes a while, February, March, they had um, uh, approved the request for two weeks, and then someone came in, and they said at the time that they needed to assess him, but they needed to bring him in um, to assess him. He, he was um, refusing any kind of um, care at home if, if um, somebody tried to take a blood test or if somebody tried to... Um, or if he had, let's say he had one fall and uh, he had to go to the hospital, he uh, would give him a hard time and refuse to go in the ambulance. So they they said that they needed to bring him in. And this is and they when he he went in is um, a hospital for dementia and um, geriatric hospital for dementia and psychotic and uh, other psychiatric problems. So while he went in on a Friday. I spent Saturday and Sunday with him, and Monday when I walked in, um, that's when I found out I only had 30 minutes. I had to say goodbye <laughs> because mm. the COVID lockdown started. Um, that was, I even had flowers. My sister sent me flowers to the hospital, and I couldn't even get those in the in the hospital. Everything was shut down completely. Mm. So I had 30 minutes to say goodbye. Oh, that that had to have just been horrible to, you know, because you're just not contemplating any of that at all. Uh, we just had a neighbor right. who, who ended up having to go to the hospital, and again, they, they dropped him off, and, and, and that was it. And he kind of knew that because we're so far into this, but especially people in the beginning are just so shocked at, at, at you know, what is happening and the emotions. It must have just, I, I would just, I would have been bawling. I don't know. I, I just said it. Yeah. Yes. So, so go ahead. So then um, um, I was fortunate enough, I was able to call in, talk to the nurses on the floor, um, so I could call in to find out a little bit about what's going on. Uh, what um happened is I think he progressed really quickly, a lot quicker than he should have, because um when I went in on the weekend it was it was the uh, weekend staff wasn't regular staff, right? And mm-hmm. when he went in on Monday, um we had one there was one doctor that had been that was looking after him and that but the doctor changed over the next couple of weeks. Things were changing, right? Mm-hmm. And there was no um uh, everything stopped, so all the things like therapy or social activities, all those things stopped. Mm-hmm. And um, this meant that, um, it, you know, uh, things would come up. The things that I might have noticed um, came up and I wasn't there. For instance, he became hy- dehydrated. So for uh, within about four days after he was in, uh, I was told that he was now on um, fluids intravenous fluids because he was severely dehydrated so he was on that for five days four or five days because he was in bed on these fluids and that he developed bed sores which of Mm. course meant that he was now in bed a little bit longer Um, and he was of course giving them a hard time was very difficult it took three or four people to to, um, anytime they needed to give him some care it took three or four people Mm-hmm. Um, so things progressed quite quickly, um, and then I saw him. It I didn't see him for four months. Then they started um, outdoor visits for thirty minutes once a week, and now uh, I can go in myself. I can go in, but I need to book, and so I'll, I uh, decided I go in for four hours a day because I have to stay in the room with him. Mm-hmm. Um, so I decided that four hours, you know, I could take one meal for that and that. Um, and at least he's still sort of, the staff will still get to know him and all that. If I stayed there all the time, then I think that would, I don't know. It's a debate that I had. Um, I had given them um, a tablet, um, hoping that they, I could talk to him 
with the tablet and everything. I didn't know there was a setup like uh, John was talking about, so I'm going to research into that. Uh, the tablet they, they didn't use. They never did use, so I got it back. Now, I use a tablet when I go in because that's what we uh, look at when we have lunch. We'll look at uh, videos from uh, or and we'll listen to songs and stuff. Um, so now I see him regularly four times a week, and I think he's improved a lot. But, of course, he's in the very late stages, so eventually he'll be in palliative care. It's mm-hmm. Right now it's borderline, I guess. Okay. Anyway, so right now I see him four times a week. And yeah. uh, there is still no, there is some therapy, I guess, but um, he's not getting, he, he was looked at by a therapist and they got him a special chair. Um, it's called a Buddha chair where he's... Um, Sort of got a seat belt on so he doesn't slide out off the chair or slide down. Sure. And um, he's on fluids only now because the food, he's having problems swallowing. So right now he's on uh, mostly a liquid diet. Okay. Anyways. Well, that's quite the journey. So when you're in, are you all garbed up then with uh, P- uh, PPE and things when you go in for your visits? When I go for my um, visits, I can I can go. I I have to book it, and I have to wear a mask the entire time I'm there. Okay. And when I go in, I go in to the room. I go in the room with him, and so mm-hmm. I can feed him and whatever. Um, so there's just the two of us during that four hours. So the nurses come by now. I I open the door. Sometimes they close it, but I <laughs> I like people around, so I open the door. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, what a what a journey though. I mean, you go in for an assessment and and then you can't see him for four months. And um, John, I know you can feel the the pain of that, even though you were able to <clears throat> to see her um, a little bit more, you know, given your situation. But um, it's just as uh, it, it's just so sad to hear. Um, I'm thrilled that you can you know get there four times a week now. Um, that's got to um, help him, I would think, emotionally a lot, because um, that had to have been a shock to his system. Oh, I think it was a big shock to his system, too, because I think he felt, well, I, I don't know if he understood what was happening, but I'm sure he felt abandoned. and. Yep. You know, because yeah. there's no way he could understand. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And I have heard that from others, too, where... Even like when they were visiting through the window, you know, the person is like, come on in, get in here. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't come in. So, um, yeah. I well, did try to talk. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I did try to talk to him on the phone, but um, he, his hearing wasn't that good. And it would depend, you know, if he was close by because they didn't have a phone in his room or anything. So. Um, I tried a few times. That didn't work that well. So, But if, yeah. if the nurse could, mm-hmm. if this, this nurse could, she'd, she'd, you know, bring the, you know, have them come to the phone, but that wasn't, wasn't always possible. Yeah. In, in the, phone is hard. the phone is hard yes. for some people, too, <clears throat> to understand. They need to see your face and read your lips and, you know, kind of take in all the communication styles. I know that's something that many people with dementia say. I never knew I relied on reading lips and, you know, people's gestures and, and all of that to figure out really what was going on. But, um, you know, the phone right. doesn't work. Or, you know, there's a couple of people I'd love to have on the show, um, but they're like, I, I can't do audio. I can do a video one, but I can't I can't do an audio. I just can't uh, follow it, can't track. So. Right. Um, John, any comments you have to what Rita went through? Yeah, I, I was just going to ask uh, Rita if she uh, do they also take her temperature uh, when she goes in? Yes. Well, every morning that I go in, I have a long list of questions that I have to check off. Yeah. And they take my temperature, and I sign papers saying I'm aware, and you know, um, as I go in, and we they do that every time I go in. The staff does it too. It's the same. Yeah. It's almost the same sheet as the staff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm treated uh, just only, like a staff member. Right. The um, I can go in my uh, at first. My nobody else could go in. Then we had a meeting, a family meeting, so his son and his daughter can go in. 
they were only going to have, uh, provide two people, and I said, no, I'm not picking between his son or daughter. So um, we had a family meeting, and they are allowing his son and his or and his daughter to go in once a week. I can go, well, I don't know if they can go in more than that. They're going in once a week. I can go in every day if I wanted to, but I'm. it's an hour drive for me back and forth, 45-minute drive. So for me to go every single day would be, uh, you know, I still live in the home and I still take care of it. It would be a little too much. So I yeah. got it down to 20 I have hours. A, that's so. one advantage I have being in the same building, and I'm grateful for that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, he was originally supposed to come back home or go to another building, but um, because of the fast progression and such, um, he is staying where he is in the hospital. Instead, the hospital is not a um, is not a long term care facility, but because he's in uh, his his progression, he will be he will not be coming out of the hospital to be placed at home or in a care home. Okay. He well, will stay great. in the hospital. Well, thank you. Thank you Which both for, for updating us and, um, on your stories. I see that Mary Todd was able to call in, so I'm going to go ahead and pull her in. Uh, Mary Todd, actually, I met on the cruise as well, and she cares for her husband, Jim. And Jim was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment in 2011 and then with Alzheimer's and vascular dementia in 2016 and they um, both live in Brightview Senior Living in Massachusetts. Mary's in independent and Jim is in memory care now for a year and uh, Mary and Jim have been married for 63 years. So welcome Mary. How are you doing today? I'm thanks Laurie. I'm doing okay. I just got back from a doctor's appointment so with Jim so my apologies for uh being so late calling in, but that's the way life goes, isn't it? Yep, that's for sure. And yeah. I actually um, I actually booked this show for a little longer length because I thought, well, we might get uh, other people calling in. I never know. I, I love to be able to encourage people to, to tell their stories, and I so appreciate you taking time to squeeze us in. Um, you know, John and, um, and Rita have both shared their stories of, you know, what happened with their lives in COVID and how it's impacted, um, how they care, and even when they're able to see their loved one. And so we'd love to hear how you and Jim are doing as well. Okay, well, um, I probably I haven't heard um, John and Rita's story, but hi, John. Hi, Rita. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I um, I was not able to see Jim. I think it must have been five months, something like that, from March to August, whatever. However, that is. Um, so that was that was awful um, when we did start. Well, and then we had some video uh, conferences or video FaceTime, and <laughs> that was that was not very satisfying uh he couldn't seem to keep looking at the screen and um one time he was looking at the screen and he was upset about something and he said i am finished talking and he walked away <laughs> so that was that was the end of that conversation um so it was the facetime was really hard i i was glad for the facetime because I needed to see him and just mm-hmm. just to see that he was physically doing okay. Um, and we tried um, some other kinds of just phone conversations, but it those were just, for him, it was almost like it was more, um, not more trouble than it was worth, but something like that. But for me, it was really important. And so I really needed the 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 contact in whatever way I could get it. That has really improved a lot with um, the outdoor visits that we've been able to have for probably maybe a month or maybe a little longer. But gee, with the masks on, it was it was so hard to understand him. And I'd be leaning in and saying, "What did you say?" And then he couldn't hear me. And it was again for me, it was. 
it was good, but it was um, when he first started doing those visits outdoors, he was like um, kind of like a wooden statue. He had he was like really anxious. His body was kind of rigid, and his eyes were mm, vacant, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, after after a couple of visits that seemed to improve some, um, now we are able to um, go in. I'm in the same situation that John is in because I'm also in the same building, and um, so I can now see him in his room. Um, they have not put a time limit on me. Well, the time limit is an hour visit, but the number of times a week, um, they're suggesting once a week, but I am going more than that. But still, I have to schedule the visit. Uh, I think that's for contact contact tasi- tracing purposes mm-hmm. so that they'll know who's who's been around and that kind of thing. So the the personal visits have been it's been really really wonderful. I think part of uh if you know it's in terms of decline it's really hard to know whether the non-visiting and all of that covid related isolation is part well certainly it's part of the decline but whether it's just the dementia um increasing you know, how do you know how much of which it is? But mm-hmm. the last, probably the last month, he's been getting uh, much more agitated and aggressive. And they did actually call me once a couple of weeks ago to see if I could come up and maybe help to calm him down. Um, he was put on um, some kind of anti psych psychotic drug, a very low dose, and they're, they don't know whether that's really working yet. I guess they were saying it might take a couple of weeks for that to kick in, but um, they were trying to give that to him, so he gets it twice a day, like at eight and two, and then as needed, and so this was an as needed time, and um, they, they, he wouldn't take it. Um, Mm -hmm. and he was protecting like another couple, uh, and he was not going to let anybody touch that couple and he was not going to let them touch him. And when I came in, it it didn't do a whole lot of good for me to come in to try to calm him down because he was, he was not having any of it. (laughs) I eventually did get him to, uh, take the medicine. It was crushed in cranberry juice, I think. And um, he did end up taking that. And it was it was interesting, I would say. I don't know the time. It's hard to know how much time goes by. But maybe 15 or 20 minutes, he had calmed down uh, significantly. And the very interesting thing is because, you know, they don't remember from one minute to the next sometimes. When he's calmed down enough and he, we were sitting out in the hall, really, because this couple that he was trying to protect, they finally got them in the room with an aide, and then a second aide locked the door, and he wrestled with her for the key to try to get in. And then, anyway, we, we sat down. I said, well, why don't we just sit down here for a minute, and we'll, we, I think maybe they're going in to take a nap. So maybe we can just stay here till they, till they are finished with their nap. And then eventually it was he was feeling... Uh, okay, I said, Jim, my back is hurting. Could we just go in your apartment and so I can sit down in a chair? And mm-hmm. then a little bit later than that, he said, I don't know what made me do that. Why did I act that way? That's that's not like me. But it was today. Uh, so he realized how kind of out of control uh, he had been, which I thought was, I thought that was pretty astute for him to be able to come up with that, you know, that feeling of oh, what, it, exactly. what it was like. Yeah. yeah. Definitely there has, that isolation has caused a decline. I was looking for some research on that, and there's 
there's quite a bit of research on, maybe not quite a bit, but some on isolation and, and old age. Uh, but I don't think that there's been any data that is researchable uh, because it's still so new about the the advance of, of um, dementia and, and the isolation. So that will be interesting to to follow. But one of the things that's really made a difference is um, I asked the, the director if uh, I could go in with a shield instead of a mask. Mm-hmm. And she agreed. And that has made a big difference. Now, you know, how do I know how much of a difference it's made? But it feels very different. And I think it is because he can see my face. Yeah. Uh, and he doesn't have to wear a mask while he's uh, in memory care. Uh, so that's good. I mean, he had the, he was asking today when we were coming back or on, on the way and coming back from the ophthalmologist, um, you know, when can I take this off? When can I take this off? And as soon as we got there, he said, can I take it off now? So um, <laughs> the, the mask is, you know, it's not, not fun for any of us. It's, awful. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. And um, I, I work at different things and trying to take care of myself, which I, I know is important. Um, and there have been several support groups. I'm in one that's, I think it's with the Alzheimer's Foundation of America. And they're I'm in Massachusetts, but there are people from Maryland and Virginia and Louisiana and Texas. Um, and that's that's been really helpful just to have that connection. And then mm-hmm. within our own group, um, there are people who live here in independent living who are caring for loved ones that are in their apartment and others who are caring for ones that are in memory care. Um, and ones who have been here and because of COVID have left. So we have someone that our organization hired to um, meet with us once a week. And that's been, that's been really, really helpful as as well. Um, So I'm, I'm fortunate. I think that even people that might be listening that would be in rural areas that might not have as much access to, um, memory care um, places or support groups of any kind. Uh, there are places that that people can find that they can connect with people in their own community or maybe in another part of the country. Um, so that that's been really helpful to have those different um, support groups um, oh, wonderful. that I can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to make a couple comments because you had talked about, you know, there's not much research. And if you go to my um, blog, and you'll have to click back one, uh, but there is a survey, um, Alzheimer's, uh, Us Against Alzheimer's uh, is working with the A-list. And they put out these short surveys that you can do online And they're on number six for the impact of the coronavirus. And, you know, they talk about... what does that mean they're on number six, Lori? What does that mean? It's the sixth survey that they've sent out. They keep kind of going... Oh, the sixth survey. Okay. Yep. And it's it's pretty interesting. They always publish what what they find. But this one talks about um, all kinds of different things. Um, It from, you know, how are you and they doing, uh, you know, emotionally, physically, um, has it impacted your finances? How, how are you sleeping? Um, you know, they're, they're just, mm. they keep finding out more and more stuff. And so I would encourage people to just go to um, okay. Alzheimer's, uh, Alzheimer's Cheeks, uh blog and um, on WordPress, and you can take that survey. It was dated September 9th when that was published. And um, again, and then sign up and be on their list because these uh, the research that they're doing is really about helping families. Um, so much of the research is, you know, clinically based and, 
you know, you have to qualify you know, to fill everything out. And they really want to hear from everybody what is going on. So I wanted to wanted to mention that because they just do an absolutely fantastic job. And That's I would also I highly recommend um, hooking up with Us Against Alzheimer's because they have a huge impact in terms of um, funding and working with the government. And they have um, some teleseminars and they're starting to do some video things now. Um, they have different groups, so they have like one for veterans, uh, one for Hispanic women. I mean, all kinds of things. They're they're really trying to dive deep into supporting, you know, all the different kind of categories dealing with this that, that might be a little bit unique and need their own own group of support and also research behind it. And they've just done phenomenal. And you know, their funds. What I love about the organization too is. You know, it goes where it says it's going. There's there's not much for overhead and, and things there, and I think that's critical, especially in this day and age. Um, the other thing I wanted to comment on was when you were describing Jim and, and uh, you know, how, he, how he's reacting, and I'm sitting back thinking, you know, with, with Jim, with Don, with Rita, with Virginia, with John, sitting back and knowing them as I did, you know, you would just never expect some of these behaviors from these people, but I know with my own mom, sure. we went through the same thing as well. And so it is common, but what I am hearing from uh, people really all around the world in communities is that they saw significant change around the three month period with their residents. They said everyone was kind of doing really good. And then there was kind of a deep dive in terms of, of change. Huh. And so I thought that that was kind of kind of interesting in and of itself as well. Now, near you also, you know, John had um, he likes to write, and so he read a limerick that he did about uh, Cherrywood Point, where he he and Virginia live. And you have written haikus. In fact, Mary did a show with me a while back on uh, her writing of haikus and published a PDF that people could download, which was beautiful. And you now have a collection kind of of uh, COVID-19 haikus. And I'm wondering if you can share a few of those with our audience, because writing is really healing, I think, on so many levels. It it really, it has been for me. Uh, when I first started writing, it was really therapeutic. Um, and I was writing haiku because... Um, a friend of mine had sent me um, a grief journal, and on the front of the grief journal, she wrote a haiku, and it was like, I had to go back and <laughs> remember from my high school days what haiku was, but it's it's three-line poem with five syllables, and then in the first line, seven syllables in the second line, and five syllables in the third line. So I just started writing, and then um, I've written some Alzheimer's love haikus and just regular grief haikus. And then I did, uh, during COVID, because it was so horrible, um, I, um, I wrote some of those too. So I'll read a couple, a couple that are related to Jim and then a couple that are related to me. Um, one for Jim is, you and I are masked. It's so hard to understand each other. You can't. And then, it's so frustrating for you. What is happening? Confusion gets worse. And then from last week, when he was so out of control, he's out of control, thinks I'm going to poison him. Calm his tortured soul. And I want to hug him, to reassure I love him. He must feel so alone. Um, and then some of the ones that, for me, the... The first part, I think maybe, I don't know if I'm getting used to, well, of course, now that I'm able to visit him, it's really different. But in the beginning, it was it was really hard. So here's one that was me. It's getting to me, physical separation. 
I need a warm hug. My love isn't here, needing someone to lean on, feeling so alone. This day just sucks. Please help me overcome this awful funk I'm in. How much more exhausted can I get? Sleep not rested, moving in a fog. Feeling overwhelmed, tears well up and overflow. Words fail me, black hole. And then there was, you know, a lot of people say, we'll get through this, we'll get through this. And then this is what they say, we'll get through this together. Makes me want to barf. (laughs) So those were just some of the ones that uh, when he was first in memory care, that that was hard as well. And then when COVID came along, so Jim has been in memory care um, just about a year now, a little over a year. So um, I wouldn't say it's still new, but it still is fresh in my mind. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I can imagine. And, and I think it is, as much as we're all getting used to it, we still know it's not our norm, and we like to the way it used to be. And then you add disease progression on top of it and the changes. Um, it's really confusing and really frustrating. And, you know, I, I love uh, your haikus because, it, you know, it's just a way to express your emotions. And I think sometimes we bottle those up and, and then we just kind of pent up and blow at, at times. I think it's a really healthy way. I think writing is a really healthy way to express your writing. Even if you never share it with anybody else, it's just kind of, get out of you. And I remember when you first started writing haikus, you said, I I was kind of shocked. They would come to me in the grocery store and they would just they just things started yeah. kind, of, kind of leaking out of you, you know? Mm, and they, it did. And yeah, I would I think, find them in the strangest places. I would have a bill or something that I was paying and and something would come to me and I'd write it on the on the back of the bill. And then I'd find it a little bit later on and say, huh, look at that. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Inter- interesting. It's, yeah. It's it's good to be able to define those moments and things. So I think it's uh, it's really healthy. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. We've got another caller on the line. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and pull her in. I believe this is Candace Williams, but we will double check here. Uh, Candace, is that you? Yes. You're there. Wonderful. Um, Candace is a care partner for her mom who has FTD, and she is a blogger and just a a huge advocate as well. And so we'd love to hear how things are going with with you and your mom and COVID during this this time that we're living through. So as far as COVID is concerned, well, it's definitely, we don't have anybody here anymore. Like, we used to have an aide come, and the aide doesn't come anymore. Uh, we stopped her from coming because we can't risk, you know, uh, getting infected. Mm-hmm. And we don't have any um, cleaning people coming in anymore. It's just, you know, because they're exposed to a lot of people, too, so we can't risk it. So um, it's pretty much very little help. Uh, right now at this point so um, as far as my mom's concerned uh, she's moved into the early part of late stage so she's having to be hand fed now she's weaker with her walking Um, she sleeps more frequently so there's definitely been some advancement okay so as a, and your situation is a little bit different from everyone else's because um, with Rita, John, and Mary, their loved one is now living away, but you've got mom at home with you. And one of the mm-hmm. things that, that, that I hear from uh, people in your situation is the, the isolation and the impact um, definitely has taken a toll. But on top of that, the lack of resources for support. Um, has has just really kind of crushed them. 
Um, are you you're feeling that as well? You're saying you're not having the housekeeper, you know, you're not having the aides come in um, for assistance. So that just puts more on your plate um, than before. Are you feeling the effects of that? Um, well, I mean, we were isolated before COVID. I think, you know, you'll hear a lot of caregivers say, you know, this is, we're used to this isolation. Um, mm-hmm. But she, I mean, my mom is pretty uh, laid back. So uh, she, you know, not having anybody in is really okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because she's, you know, she like I said, she's uh, uh-huh. so, you know, uh, I mean, I guess it just means I put more hours in, but I don't I don't really mind it. But I know for a lot of people who have uh, loved ones that are difficult to manage, it's, it's, it's very difficult for them. Yeah. Are you hearing some background noise? That must sound like there's a copy machine or something going on. Yeah, I'm hearing it. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, yeah, I don't know where it's coming from either on that. So sorry about that. It must just be a little technical difficulty here. <laughs> but we'll just keep, yeah. keep going. Hopefully it ends shortly. So whatever whatever it is, I have everybody else muted. So it's just you and I and and things. But, um, well, it's, there's a little ring there. So maybe that's the end of it. So well, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm sorry. Go ahead. I I just didn't know if it was at my end or or not. Yeah, not not having people come in hasn't really been much of an issue for us. Like I said, because she's pretty laid back and she's not like aggressive or anything like that. Uh huh. Well, that's that's good. That's good. I know a lot of people who had people going into. Um, you know, like adult day and things and, and that stop um, or support groups that they used to physically go to. Did Were you guys partaking in anything like that? Um, could you ask what was your question again? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, some people at home have had people going to like an adult day uh, placement a few times a week or maybe they were going to physical support groups together and or alone. Um, was that anything that you were partaking in? No, but since COVID, though, I have discovered uh, watching webinars to uh, help, you know, learn more information. Because now, because of COVID, uh, I would go to the Alzheimer's seminar every year, and they're not doing it this year. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, well, okay, I have to somehow supplement so I can continue to learn and so I'll have information for the blog. So I've been watching webinars and taking notes and I've been uh, actually doing online support groups as well. So Okay. Okay. And I, I think that that's uh, really, really important. Now in terms of, um, you know, your connections with others, have you, have you heard from um, other people how they're doing um, any frustrations or things that are working really well for them? So one big frustration that I'm finding a lot of people have is getting their loved ones to wear masks when they go out Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, they don't quite understand. Sometimes it's a sensory thing uh, with wearing masks. You know, some people are like, well, how do I get my loved one to wear a mask? And I've been fortunate that that's not been been a problem with my mom. Uh, Mm -hmm. Anytime I've had to take her out during covid we put the mask on her and she's fine, but she does not like for me or anybody else to wear a mask around her it, because she can't see the complete face. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, she doesn't. She doesn't mind wearing it, but she isn't really like other people wearing it. Sure, sure, yeah, and it it cuts down on the communication. You know, being able to read what's what's truly going on there. I know there are some clear masks out there, but I don't know how well they work. And I can't imagine that they wouldn't fog up. I mean, I fog up my glasses mm. just wearing my mask. So, though I have learned oh, I know to tip, the struggle. Yeah, I have learned to tip out there for all of you wearing masks that wear glasses that fog. If you take a piece of uh, Kleenex, kind of roll, fold it up, and then put it at the tip of your nose where the top of the mask is, um, that 
Kleenex will absorb the moisture and your glasses don't fog up so bad. So oh, just my, my little my little tip there. <laughs> I'm flipping them up on my head and taking them off and putting them back on again. Uh, sometimes when um, I know when I know I am out and about. Well, I appreciate you sharing your your story with us. I'm going to just pull everyone else back into the conversation. Um, and I want to ask, um, and I'm going to start with Rita first, ask if if you have had a problem, has Don had to wear a mask, and has that caused any difficulties for him understanding that or where he's at, he doesn't have to. And you may have mentioned that before. He doesn't have to wear a mask. Um, where he is, all the staff is wearing a mask. What I did is I got, I have to wear this, the mask that they assigned me, like those um, white ones there. Um, mm-hmm. What I did is got a, a see-through mask, and then when I'm with him, I'll pull down my mask and say, hey, it's Rita, I'm here, and then I'll put my mask back on. Because I can't, it's not approved, the see-through one is not approved, it just goes right over. Um, it's It looks like Anyways, it goes right over everything, um, but at least I can uh, he can see my face, and then I put the mask back on. So every okay. so often I'll I'll pull my uh, the the mouth mask down, and then he can see my face, and then I put it back up. Okay. But it's not yeah not a big issue right now. Okay, John, how about you with Virginia? Does Virginia have to wear one at all? No, when we. Uh, I, I just looked at a picture to see when we go out to the courtyard you know, for a family visit, they do not require her to wear a mask because the table is 10 foot long and she sits at one end and, and uh, family sits at the other. So the only time she's worn a mask is, well, let's see. No, I haven't taken her out. I, I took her to the hospital when she fell, but uh, we didn't have a mask. She didn't wear a mask then. That was early in the thing. Okay. I have to wear a shield as well as a mask when I'm in memory care. Okay. And how has she responded to that? Well, just no no response one way or another. The biggest problem in, when we talk about uh, effects of COVID, I, I do think that her ability to know who I am has regressed substantially from the time when I was in there essentially several times a day. Mm -hmm. At that time, I estimate that she could, 40 to 50% of the time, she knew who I was. I'd say 10% of the time, she, uh, that now, the majority of the time, she doesn't know who I am. And so I, I, I think that is related to uh, the isolation of COVID. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mary, how about, how about you? Um, how has Jim done with the mask? Has, does he have to wear one at all? I, I think you said he didn't. And, and how does he relate yeah. to you? Yeah, he doesn't. One? Yeah. He does not have to wear one when he's in memory care. Uh, but he does have to wear one like today when we went out to, um, the doctor's office, he had to have it on for the whole time. So it was probably half an hour ride there, and then we got there early. So it was quite a long time that he had it on. But it, he really doesn't seem to mind it all that much. Uh, but I did a, I did very similar to what Rita did when we were having our outdoor visits. And he was, especially at the beginning, I think I mentioned that he was so rigid and anxious and stuff. And I just took my mask off. And said, mm-hmm. Jim, look at me. It's Mary, and we're married. I just want mm-hmm. you to know. Can you look at me? Um, and then I, but you know, I don't know how long that would last. And I think it's kind of similar to John. I, um, there are days when I'm sure he has no idea who I am. And then other days that I think he has an inkling. And I heard one day one of the staff said, uh, do you know who that is sitting over there? And he said, that nice lady. And he was talking about me. And I thought, well, that's that's good. I'll take it. <laughs> Rather than that, you know. At least you like the else. assessment. Right, right. So, um, 
no. So when he's in his room and I go to see him, I am lucky that I can just get by with a shield. And I don't know if that maybe is because I'm pretty protected where I am in the senior living residence as well. So I'm not mm-hmm. seeing hardly anybody either. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, but uh, the shield is is really just like a godsend. It's just been such a a wonderful um, ability to to be able to use that instead of the mask. Yeah. So, but I think for you know, you know, like with my daughter's meeting with him outside or something, I I don't think he knows who she. Well, I don't think he knows who she is anyway. Um, but the mask or without, it's it's hard to say. Mm-hmm. I have one one last question. I just want to um, ask both of you, and I'm going to start with Candace first. Um, Candace, I'm just wondering if there's if there's anything that is um, weighting you down that you would like to see changed, other than make COVID go away. And and have you found any kind of blessings in this whole isolation thing with COVID? Um. I think, you know, as far as, like, you know, uh, my mom has early onset dementia. She was diagnosed at 57, and it just seems like, you know, from the time that she was diagnosed nearly seven years ago and now, there's really not a lot of resources uh, for early onset. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see more. Yep. Because, you know, and there's really not a lot of uh, information about FTD, you know, and so I I would like, you know, for FTD to be as known as Alzheimer's. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, during COVID, Alzheimer's still gets a lot of press and attention, but uh, FTD hasn't, still is pretty much non-existent, so... Yeah, I know Louie Body has has raised, and I think, and I and 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 honestly, I think FTD has somewhat, but not near to the magnitude. I think, again, Alzheimer's. A lot of people refer to all dementias as Alzheimer's. They don't really still understand it, um, but we're making headway. Um, so thank you, thank you for sharing that. Any any blessings that you've seen wrapped in this disease? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's given me more time with my mom, you know, because she's not going to get any better, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I do see the decline in her. And I've definitely had a couple of scares with her since uh, COVID. And, you know, it's just given me more time with her. You know, like now that I have to feed her by hand, you know, I actually enjoy it as a time for me to bond with her. And, um you know, giving her drinks and, you know, one-on-one care can be tedious at times, but uh, I actually don't mind it. I, I find it more more bonding, actually, than when we had people in and out. So. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Mary, how about you? Any um, Anything that keeps you anxious or worried about this time period for future and any blessings that you've seen wrapped wrapped in COVID? Um, well, I think one of the blessings for me has been just the writing haiku, which is something that I never did before. And I would say there are, I don't know, maybe two or 300 of them that I've written. And that certainly wouldn't have happened had this, had Mm. not Alzheimer's itself come along. And then my friend, uh, encouraging me to, to write and, you know, it's one of those things. I'm, I'm not a journalist. So, I mean, a journaler. Um, so that's something I have good intentions about. And then all of a sudden when this came, the opportunity, and I wrote and they just started, like, tumbling out of me. That was that was great, I think, for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it has made me more compassionate. Uh, it's... Um, and more of an advocate. Uh, so there's, I think it's just so misunderstood and such a, oh, I, I want to say stereotype, but that stigma 
is what I'm looking for. Uh, the stigma is there, and it's just it's just really sad that that um, stigma is there. And so I'm, you know, that has been that has been a, a good thing I think that's come out for me that I understand more and am willing to share more because I kind of know more. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that was really hard for me recently um, when he was refusing to take his meds <clears throat> is that they have decided to take him off of all his, what they call maybe non-essential meds, so vitamins and fish oil and B-complex, all of those, uh, because some of those are just mega pills and are hard to swallow, which was they think part of the reason he was refusing his meds because he couldn't swallow them. But now they're they're crushing his meds and putting them in ice cream or whatever their yogurt, whatever they're putting them in. But that was just really hard for me because originally I was having breakfast with him every morning and I would see the nurses come in and they would have the meds crushed for people and give them to them. And I think all of those people, and I think they were mostly women that they were doing this with, they've all gone. They're all deceased. And it was like, oh, my goodness, is is that what this means? You know, that Mm -hmm. he's having his meds going to be crushed now? It just was, I was like, I was thrown for a loop when I thought about it. And we do have access to a Jerry Psych and I mentioned it to her how how awful that was just to think that that is coming down the pike. And she said, you know, she did not think that that was something that was imminent. Um, so um, that was really, really helpful to hear because he's physically he seems to be still quite strong. And I think he's walking a lot uh, in the hallways. And, um, and he was strong as an ox when he was upset that day and aggressive. Uh, when he grabbed my arm, it was like, gee whiz. <laughs> um, so that was, that was a little bit of a surprise. I have he's such a, a mild man. His, his life as a former pastor, um, you know, that just was so unlike him and that kind of behavior so yeah that that definitely was a a downer okay Um, well well, I just want to throw in my mom um, had her pills crushed and mixed in pudding and all different types of things for years Um, and so and she was she was very healthy too but that was just something you know the, the whole pill thing and I think part of it is you know and and I know John will have an opinion on this because he's kind of going through this himself. But, um, you know, with my mom, I don't know if it was so much that she couldn't swallow because she, she could eat even when they were crushing her pills. I think it just felt foreign to her um, mm-hmm. to swallow a pill. So one example I'll give you is my mom used to love a peanut buster parfait at, at Dairy Queen. That was like her favorite treat. And um, one day she was eating it and she thought the peanuts were rocks. She just didn't understand what what it was she was eating. And she thought, you know, here's everything smooth and now here's this hard thing. What the heck is this? Mm -hmm. And so then we switched um, to a blizzard, you know, that just had fine little crunchies in it. Until all of a sudden she realized um, in her mind that there was sand in her food. Cause that's what it felt oh. like. Cause it, you know, because they lose, you know, some of some people lose their sense of taste and, and smell. And so when you lose that, you know, I can see where they would come up with that. And when we're trying to jab just these hard yeah. pieces in. Laurie, you're breaking up. For, you're breaking up for me, Laurie. I'm, you're, I'm getting a few words here and a few words there. I don't know if that's true for others. Uh, is everyone else having a hard time hearing me? It could just be our internet connection. I don't know. Uh, not now. Me? Earlier there was some uh, there was some breaking up, but not not at present. Okay. Okay. So, so I think with with um, I, I apologize, folks. It's out of my control. <laughs> you know, with the 
with the internet. Exactly. Um, but I think that, you know, again, when they lose their sense of, of smell, they lose their, their sense of taste, and, you know, things are foreign, it doesn't make sense to them. Um, I, I think that's more what happened with my mom versus she couldn't swallow. There, then there came a point in time where um, she did need pureed food. But she was on pureed food for several years, too. So, um, you know, every person is different. And, yeah. and and yet I know that that's a thought because every time they lose some, something um, that they used to be able to do and you have to adapt and change, I think it's normal for, you know, is this it? Is this it? Are we getting closer? Yeah, you know? yeah. And that thought, and, you know, bottom line is we didn't know. I mean, my mom lived with her disease for 30 years, and I can tell you how many times um, both friends and family, acquaintance, and even doctors said that's impossible. And yet you see today how many people are living longer because they're getting diagnosed earlier. And, um, you know, so there's so little that we know about this. John, what comments do you have? I know you probably want to make a comment on the eating and the pills and things. Um, and then I'd like you to talk about if there's anything you're anxious or worried about and, and blessings from COVID. Okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Well, uh, recently there's been an issue here uh, over crushing medication uh, in that uh, the facility wants to charge me for it, and we're fighting over that. But uh, so they uh, enlisted a uh, speech therapist, which I thought was kind of funny, but apparently the speech therapist, in addition to dealing with speech, uh, monitor how people swallow. Well, they've concluded that she has absolutely no trouble whatsoever about swallowing because when I feed her, a lot of times I forget I'm feeding her and I give her a bite the size that I would take and she <laughs> chews it and swallows it okay. But when the therapist was with her, I recorded that and watched it, and she just didn't like the feel of that pill. She'd spit them out, or she'd mm -hmm. move them over into her cheek, oh, and yeah. um, she just didn't want to swallow them. It wasn't she couldn't. Part of it was just being a little bit stubborn and and, and uh, didn't need it, you know. So yeah. that's uh, uh, we're back to crushing the. <laughs> again now but uh, in terms of uh, I can't say there's any specific blessing to taking things away but I think I have I have always been a type A impatient personality and I think I am more accepting now than I have been in the past which puts me a little bit at ease less stressful I don't know if that's Mm -hmm. Makes sense, but I, I I I do not feel terribly stressed. I would prefer things were different, but I don't feel terribly stressed, and I think I've just kind of learned to live with it. So maybe that is a blessing. I think that's a huge blessing. You know, when you can you kind of come to a, a peacefulness in some ways uh, with it. I know I found that for myself. It was I was able to to let go and before I would focus on how can I fix something I can't fix, you know, or yeah, that's I, a very good a, analogy. Yeah. Or I was focused on a, a set time frame and I learned to let it go. It, not everything needs to be done in my world at, in my time frame. And then I, you know, I found that my folks were right when they used to tell me, you know, it'll be there tomorrow, <laughs> you know, type thing, or you'll find out you really didn't have to do it in the first place. So I, I think there's a, I think that's a huge blessing to, to be able to get into that, to get into that space. Um, one thing, John, I wanted to mention, and this might be another angle for you with the community is, you know, it's not that she can't physically swallow. It's that the disease is um, interrupting her her brain uh, and thought pattern because she doesn't know what a pill is or what she's supposed to do with it, and it feels foreign. You know, so it's not necessarily yeah, not a, a physical thing. You know, it's 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 a whole different type of process. But I I um, I, I just I find it funny because I mean, for years, and my mom's been gone six years now. And she lived in a in the nursing home for 14, 
And for a lot of those years, she got her pills crushed. I mean, it's just common practice. There was never, ever a fee for that. And, you know, with COVID, and I don't know if this is the case there or not, but I think with COVID, some communities are looking at how do we we recoup costs um, because oh, there are... Oh, no question about it. The timing of fun. this <laughs> was absolutely, absolutely uh, uh, easily identified as what you said, need to recoup some cost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let me go I through. I just found out oh. recently that hospice uh, is going to pay for some of the meds, and I didn't, I didn't know that before. Um, but they will pay for the ones that are um, related to the hospice diagnosis, not any mm-hmm. other diagnosis. So Jim is on hospice because uh, he was having heart problems, and I didn't want him to have a, a pacemaker, and um, was I thought it was too invasive and uh, so that was the reason he was on hospice and his hospice diagnosis 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 is um, end stage cardiac and so Mm -hmm. all the meds that are cardiac related they will be paying for now we're arguing over Mm -hmm. how far back they'll go because the pharmacy says that usually it's only 90 days and he's been there for a year so um, they're they're looking into that, but when you when you were speaking, um, Laurie, about the the brain interrupting the signals and stuff, that was mm-hmm. so apparent to me today when we were going to the ophthalmologist. And yeah. you know what do you see? And uh, with my mom, he, he switched yeah, from the eye yeah, chart to um, to animals. And then there well, got to be a he, he, yeah, they either. they did they tried they tried that, but I think it's just that the brain doesn't tell him what it is. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah, so, that's very common. Uh huh. I so, see that know, in just, things other than the pills. Mm-hmm. Yep. Just as simple as as uh, sitting in a chair when she's hanging on to it. She doesn't know what a chair is exactly. or doesn't seem to comprehend. Yeah. Right. Or when they're or when they're in the shower they don't understand where the water came from. It just hit and it's hard. Yeah. And um, you know, they it, lose some of their nerve protection there and it actually hurts. And so it's like um, she can't process uh uh verbal or visual information. Mhm. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me go ahead and pull a Rita in because I'd like to hear from Rita if there's anything that you are anxious or worried about. And then if there have been any blessings, any kind of life lessons or whatever that you have learned that you, you feel are a gift during this time. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> this morning I told I was talking to the doctor. I had an injury on by phone and I said there are two things that are keeping me awake right now <laughs> and he laughed <laughs> he's used to the way I <laughs> talked to him and one was uh, his restraints in his chair and the mm-hmm. other one was his nutrition so mm-hmm. right now uh, he's on liquid nutrition and he explained that the uh, speech uh, the speech pathologist or uh, therapist had and the dietitian, dietitian had uh, dis- talked about his ability to swallow and he has to continue on this liquid form of food otherwise the food either sits in his uh, mouth or sits in his throat and mm-hmm. there are problems mm-hmm. so now he's on liquid um and then the um the chair well I the physical therapist is the one who said that there he had to have this special uh it's called I forget the name now Bodner chair I forget anyways um and it's sort of there's a, a tie in there. So uh, and I told him that I found you know him being restrained all day long was very upsetting to me. So they're going to check every uh, the doctor will remind the staff to check every half hour to make sure that they, he's not he doesn't feel like he's really restrained. It's mm-hmm. more just a protection, mm-hmm. like a seat belt in the car. But anyways, uh, blessings I've 
there's been a lot um in ten years i've i started to um uh, when I started to live in the moment, I learned from Don how to be patient and to live day to day. And I started uh, writing um, a daily thing that I share on Facebook, where I talk. I, I choose joy and I choose hope, and I um, talk to different things I can do every day to, you know, make the day go uh, and to keep a positive attitude and stay stay uh, hopeful. Mm-hmm. Um, also, um, I like as a teacher. I always want to share, so I've uh, taken a lot of courses through uh, online, um, and that helped me a lot. I took uh, courses through John Hopkins and through dementia, the Australia Awakens dementia courses, um, and and they've and I've even taken it more than once. Um, other caregiver courses online and such. So all of those things kept me learning, which I like, and I was able to share it online on uh, diff- in different sites, and then I started contributing online to groups. Um, so that was good for me. Um, and the recently, the most recent one is they gave me an individual care plan for my husband uh, that the nurse had written up for her. She had three fro- focus or three goals. So I added my three, <laughs> and because uh, I was a teacher at one time, so I knew about individual plans. So I added my three, so um, I, I, I felt more comfortable uh, feeling like I was part of the team still, even though I'm not in the, in there as much as possible. So it has been um, a difficult. It has been has been a roller coaster, but I've been able to. Um, um, change my perception and find the positive each day or I make an effort to do that um, make an effort to appreciate every day my blessings you know that he's still alive that uh, he's in the hospital if, if I had him at home all the caregiving was cancelled and I was certainly wouldn't have been able to last so by ending up in the hospital um, he was taken care of because mm-hmm. two weeks before he went in they had cancelled all all the caregiving so I would have been, you know, it wouldn't have lasted long if I had to, to uh, if if it happened that I had to stay, because I know those two weeks were very difficult, when I had no care, no help, no assistance. So yeah. the fact that he went in ended up being a blessing, and where the he is, they're all trained in dementia. Um, here I had caregivers that weren't trained, so they're all trained in dementia, so we're all talking the same language. So that is good every day. And even um, now I'm involved in uh, the Alzheimer's Association and Dementia International. Um, and even when I talk to the doctors or the nurses, you know, we're talking the same language, which is nice. Mm-hmm. Um, and the concern. So, um, yeah, there's been a lot of tears, but there's been a lot of good days. Yeah, and I, I love how you focus on the hope and the joy. And I think... You know, to me, that's one of the things this disease has taught me is, you know, we have a choice on what we're going to focus on. And not that you can ignore what's going on around you, but you can always find joy if you look for it. Um, And it might be much smaller than, you know, what used to bring us happiness. You know, it it doesn't have to be big and flashy anymore. It can be really subtle and, and really still and really quiet. And yet, I think it, it just uh, elevates our connection um, when we when we choose to go that route, um, you know. And not everybody does, and and not everyone in, in every family. I just want to thank all of you for for joining me today. I want to throw one other uh, thing and just add on to Mary's comment about hospice because this was something that um, kind of irritated me actually. With, with both my parents were on hospice at the very end. But what I didn't know um, was that not only can hosp- will hospice cover some costs, but they, uh, you know, those medications, but they know uh, to ask to ask for a liquid med instead of a pill form. And I was shocked at how many of the medications my mom could get in a liquid form. And no one ever brought that up, and not at one, you know, care conference. 
and yet this would be a topic that we'd all struggle with. And so, um, you know, hospice um, and palliative care have a lot of resources and a lot of knowledge, and they really advocate for quality of life. And, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, if your loved one qualifies, um, you know, it's it's a brilliant thing, and it's a great support. And, and for me, um, it helped me breathe easier knowing that I – because some, sometimes I think you feel you're alone advocating for your loved one. Um, even if you're part of a team, there there come those moments where it's like, okay, we're going to clash right now. <laughs> and to have that extra support, um, I know, gave me a sense of calm and a sense of, of hope, um, especially when you were kind of backed into a corner and, you know, you thought there wasn't an answer and all of a sudden they would come up with something and even if it didn't work out, at least it was another mode that was tried and it educated me on something else to ask and spread the word on. Um, so, you know, kudos for people who are taking advantage of those services. Um, Lance, I just want to wrap up with um, John's Limerick and Mary's Haikus. Uh, they're willing to share. There are links on the radio show uh, where you can go ahead and download those um, as well as on the blog. And um, what else was I going to say? Oh, John, I wanted to ask you because uh, I don't know if you've ever written anything up on how to set up your iPad setting um, for, you know, for setting it up in in a loved one's room um, or if you'd be willing to do that or if people could reach out to you if they had comments um, or questions on how to do that. Um, Is that something you're open to or... Oh yes. As a matter of fact, uh, I I have since planted four others for other people here for their families, and uh, no, I, I anything that I can do to help. And I, I am used to writing uh, tutorials, visual tutorials, you know, with with pictures of what button to push. And if anyone would like that, I'd be happy to do it for them. Okay. Sounds good. And what would be the best way for them to get a hold of you? Do you want them to go through me, or are you comfortable giving out an email or a phone number? Oh, sure. The the email or phone number, the the, the email is uh, our initials, Virginia and mine. It's John Richard Sweeney, Virginia Hope Sweeney 70 at gmail.com. So J-R-S-B-H-S-7-0 at gmail.com. And the phone number is 612-810-2161. Can you repeat that, John? Yes, please. Yeah, which which one, the phone or or the email? Is it J-R-S-B-H-S? Yeah, phonetically, it's our initials, John Richard Sweeney, Virginia Hope Sweeney, 70 at gmail.com. Does that make sense? Yep, yep. Okay, wonderful. And the phone, phone number uh, 612-810-2161. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. It and has then been here's... such a blessing for me. Oh, yeah. I, I it, And I think it, I think it would... Uh, be very helpful for for others as well. Um, Mary, with you, if people are interested in learning more about haikus, are you open to talking to people about how to get started? Uh, well, I I don't certainly I don't consider myself an expert on it, but sure. And if okay. they would contact me by email, that would be good. And it's m todd t o d d seven five at Verizon dot net v e r i z o n dot net wonderful um well again thank you so much everyone and um i don't know if uh if rita if there's if you would like to give people a contact for you um as well or not if they were interested in in uh in chatting okay um I I'm I am on Facebook under my name, Rita Deloncha. R I T A D E L O N G C H A M P D E Longchamp. Um my uh, email is Rita period Deloncha at 
gmail.com. And you said your name so much more beautiful than I did. <laughs> I love it the way you say it. <laughs> I I can't figure um, it out, Rita. Sorry, I can't I can't do it. My tongue won't twist around that way. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. But I'm very, um, I'm very glad I, to hear you, Rita. Thank you. I I was glad to hear you too, Mary. Um, I I'm also on. I started a Yeg Dementia Cafe for for, but I haven't opened it up to public yet because uh, of the COVID. I was going to start one here. I started on Facebook, but um, I haven't uh, opened it up yet. Um, to uh, yeah, people can join, but I haven't really talked about it. I've practiced on Facebook and my site and um, other sites, and I was looking at starting my own. So first of okay. all, I got to see what. What's possible? So I'll be interested to learn more about the Dementia Cafe John mentioned and you mentioned. Yeah, if you go to memorycafedirectory.com, you can, when you're ready, yes. um, you can go ahead and Dave would be more than glad to list you there. And he's doing, he's listing virtual cafes separate as well. Um, and, you know, there's about 900, I want to say 900 cafes that he has listed. And out of that, there's maybe only 40 or 50 that have gone virtual. So the need is really great. Um, so okay, if you get that up and, up and running, you know, um, check that out, uh, memorycafedirectory.com. And, and then, the nice thing yeah. about the virtual ones is that, you know, you can just be anywhere. We just had uh, some friends who moved from our area down to Virginia, and they called back in, and another family mm-hmm. that's moving from our area to Vermont, and they're going to call back in. So, um, you know, the virtual uh, thing is really, in a perverse way, been a blessing. Yep. Yes. Yep. <laughs> It really has. It really has. Um, Candace, I want to go to you. Um, would you like to give uh, the audience any contact information for you, for your blog or Facebook page or whatever? Yeah, sure. So my um, web address for our blog is at our, F as in Frank, T is a tree, D is in dog, journey.com. So our FTD journey.com. Uh, our email is our journey at our journey dot um I'm sorry our journey at our FTD journey dot com. Um, we're on Excuse Facebook. Excuse me, Candace. Twitter. Are you Candace? Are you saying FTD like for the frontotemporal? Yes. Okay, I was I put down something else. So I I need <laughs> yeah, it again. F-t-d, FTD journey. Yeah, our ftdjourney.com. Okay. Okay. And you. we are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Just created a Pinterest page, and I'm starting to um, put some merch up on um, Etsy, so you can mm-hmm. um, find us on on uh, our FTD journey at all those spots. Wonderful. Well, I again. See. Great. Thank you all for your time today. Um, I, My intuition told me to book this for, you know, two hours because I thought we would go longer than, than the normal hour of the show. And I was right. We're over uh, 90 minutes at this point. But I, I so thank you each for taking the amount of time that you did with us today to share um, your journey and giving us some hope and uh, some alternatives uh, in terms of how to live with this disease and some insight. So thank you so much, and um, best of luck. Thank to you, all. Laurie. Okay. Yes, Bye thank now. You, thank you very much, Laurie. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, thank you all for listening today, and please go ahead and share this far and wide. We'll be doing other open mics uh, over time, so uh, and you're always free to call in when we do live shows. So please keep that in mind, and maybe you can be our next guest. Just reach out to me at Lori, L-O-R-I, at alzheimersspeaks.com. Bye now. Bye, Lori. Bye, Bye, Rita, John, and Candice. Bye, all of you, Candice, Lori, uh, Mary, John. Well, oh, yes. Okay. And I'll be in touch. It's time to rethink. 
Renew and Reimagine Retirement. Hey everybody, Jared Sebesta here, host of Retire Repurposed. Now this podcast is about the non-financial parts of retirement, which many times can be even more challenging than the financial. We believe retirement is not the end, rather the beginning of what could be the most impactful, purposeful, and fulfilling season of a person's life. So don't retire, become repurposed. To listen now, search Retire Repurpose on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.